going to be talking about analyzing traffic patterns with Apache NiFi. Today's agenda will be going into what you can do with NiFi. So we'll be looking at different use cases as well as going into how you can take the NiFi data, fla data flow platform and start building your own applications targeting particular IoT use cases. We'll go into the fundamentals of data flow in general, some of the challenges that arise, as well as an overview of NiFi. So what is NiFi, why is it so important, and how, what's under the hood? How is it able to do what it does? And then I'll jump into a demo, so more of a hands-on portion of this presentation that's based on the hands-on workshop that you guys will be going through at the end of today's meetup. And I'll also point you to some different resources that will help you get started with NiFi as well as a lot of these other big data tools. So what can we do with NiFi? I mean, there, there's a whole bunch of data everywhere, and there's this talk about Internet of Anything, Internet of Things, and people bring up this connected world that we're a part of, connected devices, websites, devices such as cars, wind turbines, websites, social media. I mean, there's the presidential candidate, uh, social media, like on uh, Facebook that recently happened, and with these different big data tools, you can actually go out, take all this data, and make predictions on who you think would win, and it's, a, there's a lot you can do. So just some examples of particular projects you could get going with Apache NiFi. You could work with smart cities, such uh, more specifically in traffic congestion, where you're monitoring the public transportation in San Francisco Muni area. And then what's happening is you're taking this data, you're enriching it to the point where instead of just looking at latitude and longitudes, you're actually seeing neighborhoods that are uh, neighborhoods that public transportation vehicles pass by on their routes. And say you wanted to make a future enhancement to this particular project, you'll actually be learning how to do this in the demo in the lab later. But you could go out and look at a comparison between public transportation duration versus um, the amount of time that it would take you to walk from point A to B and have by sending you out notifications based on like I think you should walk to work versus taking public transportation. And then we have smart buildings. So smart buildings, you could take a whole bunch of different HVAC data systems, say 20 buildings, and you have a whole bunch of historical data from d structural data stores. You could use another tool with NiFi called Scoop, and you could actually bring these unstructured data, structured data together, further process it with a platform known as the Hadoop platform, and you could use other tools such as Zeppelin, it's another uh, tool within the uh, Ambari stack, um, but it allows you to visualize the data. So instead of having tables of data, you have more meaningful insights to data like map visualizations. So you could actually see where these buildings are that have certain thresholds um, where the temperature is very hot at particular buildings, very cold, and see which ones are uh, having normal building temperatures so there's a lot of different use cases you can tackle, and I point out pollution, but really this, this picture here shows a lot more. I mean, there, there's a lot within the environment that you can read data from, and you can literally extract all the different data sources from these different areas within the environment. NiFi is very flexible, it has a lot of extensions. It's a great tool You can figure out a lot of different projects to work on, such as making predictions on the ecosystem, being able to pinpoint at a certain time in the future where there will be a portion of the ecosystem that's vulnerable and you can actually figure out ways to deal with those vulnerabilities before they go out of hand. For example, climate change. Yeah. So now I'm gonna show you how you, just a few steps on how you could take the NiFi data flow platform and start building your own applications targeting particular IoT use cases. So. There's just three, three key areas to focus on here. So common abstraction layer latency and agile application development. I'm sure we've heard of them before. But so this first phase just involves what particular data do we want to work with and which data sources are these, all this data being generated coming from. And then the next one is, so when you get into NiFi, and I'll go into this later, but 
you can choose to have a single noted NiFi instance. So when you guys go through the labs, you'll most likely be running single noted NiFi instances on your laptops versus having an entire NiFi cluster where you'd have multiple NiFi nodes. So say you have a network of computers who are, you all are connected together in this room. The, each particular NiFi instance is like a node and you guys in the room would act as a cluster together. And then you'd look at the particular framework like Ruby on Rails, Scala and Play to create the web application uh, development portion. So latency we need to consider with the web application just because we want to know how fast is it going to be that our, ingest, our data is being ingested to being sent onto our web application. We want to know the response time that users are actually seeing the real-time data when they're interacting with the app. We don't want them waiting like five minutes, 20 minutes just to see you know, the results. And then there's the ab agile application development. So software lifecycle process that you can undertake. So looking at requirements, what are the customer's expectations or our employer has come to us with a particular problem they want us to solve and based on those particular uh, criteria, we come up with design mockups which is just sketch ups of our graphic user interface and what we imagine the users would um, use to interact with our application. And we also have, once that's figured out, uh, ways to go about implementing the whole processing of data. So what code are we going to write to figure out how to further process the data as well as how are we going to uh, actually take these design mockups and bring them into real life applications, uh, user interfaces that people can interact with. And unit testing, so unit testing is just people within the team actually going out testing the app, seeing if it meets their expectations, and you can go a step further where once it does meet your expectations, you can bring it out to the public and look at their feedback and further enhance the app. So now that we learned about some of the particular areas of this connected data world that we can tackle, let's go into the fundamentals of data flow in general. So there's this whole concept of batch processing versus stream processing. And it usually comes up when we're talking about data in motion, data at rest. What's the difference between this traditional data store as well as the difference between Hadoop's distributed file system versus these other areas where we have data that's constantly moving. So we're looking at tools like Apache NiFi, Storm, different tools to deal with the moving data. So when you're dealing with data at rest, you write the queries, you send them out to your data storage, and then you're asking questions like, who's taking Comfy 188? Who are the professors that are teaching that class? And that data is being retrieved back to you. So you're analyzing the data while there's particular location that's at storage versus as the data is moving real time, like a traffic, uh, like downtown's traffic right now, you can actually send the queries out to where all that traffic is flowing, the data, and you can have those queries routing the data in real time, processing it, so then once it lands in your, say, Hadoop file system or your traditional data store, you can have it already structured there for you. You have the data the way you want it to be represented. So here is just another visualization of this connected world. We have all these different producers, so planes, cars, traditional databases, smartphones, and they're, being, they're generating all loads of data. They're actually being ingested into this pipe called the internet, and eventually it's going to land at a consumer or just your data storage or an area where you can further process the data with more complex computations. So just a simplistic view, you acquire the data, it goes through a data flow. Once it reaches the end, it either lands where you can store the data in different storage options, or you can further process the data with streaming tools like Apache Spark, Storm, etc. So let's, let's dive into this, this pipe further. So you can have scripts that ingest the data in Perl, Python, C++, Java. And then in this middle section here, 
you have operations that are being performed on the data, transforming it. So by the time that it lands, there will be a script for it to land, it will be somehow transformed and different than what it was like when it came in to the pipe. So if we go a step further into this pipe and we look at what, what's really inside it, there's a lot of different entities. So there could be stream processing entities as well as data flow entities. We'll, we'll get into what the names of these are. But they'll be working together, processing the data, making predictions on it, transforming the data format, just processing the data by the time it gets to the landing. So there's a lot of different challenges that arise in this whole process between ingesting data and landing it into our structural data store, Hadoop. And we can't really account for when software is going to crash as well as network failures. So what actually happens to the data during that time period? As well as if we have a whole bunch of data that's being ingested and the, the rate at which they're generating is so fast that another particular portion of the data flow, is another entity there isn't able to actually keep up with processing the data, there's an issue of back pressure that comes up. And that's not an on, the only variable that comes into the picture. There's also, you have all these unknown variables that come into the picture when you're dealing with data that's being generated at these random sources, such as data formats, as well as the speed at which they're being generated, as well as the corrupted data. And here's just a little sketch article about, there's so many standards out already. So imagine you're on 10 different teams. And all of you guys are working with different data formats. And there's one person who's the leader overseeing the entire team who just one day comes, comes up with this idea. Let's just create a one standard. So instead of using J JSON, Avro, XML, you're going to end up using just JSON. The teams that are comfortable with using their particular data formats won't abide by that. But with NiFi, it doesn't matter. You can use any data format you want. You can ingest it anyway. And we'll jump into NiFi. So I'll give you just an overview. What is NiFi? Why is it so important? As well as what's under the hood. So as you can see here, there's this visual canvas. And you have these different entities or blocks that actually go and perform the operations on data as it's moving throughout the flow. The idea that developers had when they were coming up with this, this whole system was instead of having to go and write numerous lines of code, they could actually just visualize everything into a nice structure. And therefore, you wouldn't have to, when you want to add a new feature, you wouldn't actually have to look through these millions of lines of code. Let's just say you could go in, bring in a new entity from, here's a component toolbar, like right there to the right of the NiFi logo and drop that in place in a particular area of the data flow and easily add that new feature versus having to look through a lot of lines of code and just the rate at which you'll uh, make that new feature could be weeks, months versus just a couple days. So I talked a little bit about the visual canvas. NiFi, another advantage of it though is it's very configurable. So you have data that's coming in at different areas of the data flow, and you want to prioritize data. So you could think of it like this. You have your house that's on fire. You have a power plant that's about to explode. And data prioritization actually comes into play. Like, I need to focus on this particular area because my house is on fire. Um, and you can schedule. You can schedule which data is going to be processed uh, sooner. And then data provenance. So that is tracking the data lineage, actually. So you have this entity here. I'll jump into what, what this actually is. But you have data that's moving into it, as well as data that's being output. During that whole process, the data is being transformed, it's being modified. And we want to know what's the relationship between those two points, the lineage. So I can see how was the data before it went into the, the entity, as well as what, how did it change? And another interesting feature, I like to call this uh, reversing time, NiFi feature that they have. 
if it didn't meet what you expected, you could actually reverse uh, the data packet that was flowing into this entity and reconfigure the processor real fast and then make that switch and just verify if it met your expectations. Very fast uh, turnaround and easy to debug. So if there isn't already a particular block or component that meets your data processing needs, you can actually go and customize your own entities. So then it'll handle your particular use case. Every single point in this data flow is secure and is provided by these different secure protocols. So let's talk about some of the building blocks when it comes to building your data flow. You should really know these terms before you actually go out and start building it. So here are just the terminology, the terms that are involved in any particular data flow that you'll create. A flow file, so that's like an object or a data packet that's moving throughout the system and it contains attributes. So these attributes are actually like the metadata of your flow file. And you can think of it like an HTTP data packet. And then the flow file also contains content. So what is it like when I dive into the flow file? What do I see? That's the text, that's the particular data format that's there. We call that binary content. And then there is over 190 different processors. The processors are the mechanisms that perform the actions on the data as it's moving throughout the flow. And the interesting part about this is it's not just the NiFi team who contributes to this large number, it's the actual community. So maybe one day Mushtaq over there could come up with a new processor, build it, and then say, I came up with this great idea, I want to contribute it to the open source. NiFi team is like, all right, let's bring it in. Now you have 195 processors instead of, say, on 194. And that's how we get all these different processors dealing with the wide range of challenges that come into data flow. It's a community driven team. So I'll just jump into uh, giving you just a, a demo. I'll give you two demos actually of NiFi. So I'm going to run NiFi on my local machine. So I'm going to open my terminal. I'm going to navigate to my applications folder. And then my HDF is included there. We want to go into NiFi. It's located in the bin directory. It's located in the bin directory. Can you see that? Awesome. OK. So it's located in the bin directory. Now, we'll see that ls is to list files, in case you didn't know, within the directory. To run NiFi, we need to target this NiFi.sh file, dot forward slash NiFi. Sh. We're going to start the data flow, so we need to tell NiFi we want to start this program. Okay, it'll take about a minute, so during this time, I'll, I guess I'll just give you a walkthrough of the learning the ropes of NiFi, which was now is called analyzing traffic patterns with Apache NiFi. Okay, so. So it'll be this one. If you search, you'll notice that it's the second link. So what you'll learn how to do in this lab, it's a tutorial series, so it's comprised of tutorials, step-by-step -step instructions that'll guide you through how to build your data flow. You'll learn how to take in XML data, you'll learn how to transform it to JSON data format, and then you'll actually learn how to work with this NiFi UI. So, yeah, okay. Okay, so you'll actually go in after that and you'll further enhance the data. So we have latitude, longitude, we'll change that to nearby neighborhoods that the transit vehicles pass by. Well, you learn to use Google Places API. So if any of you are fans of Google, NiFi makes it very easy to integrate other technologies with the, the data flow. So then, oh, that was tutorial two actually, whoops. I, I was ahead of myself. Tutorial one is actually transforming the data to JSON. Tutorial two is enhancing the data flow with 
nearby neighborhoods that are close to these vehicles. Tutorial zero will actually just show you how to set up your NiFi environment on local machine or on the Hortonworks sandbox. And then the third one is just going to show you how to take in a live data stream. All right, let's see if NiFi is up and running now. So it'll be 8080-4-4-NiFi. Okay, that's actually very small. We'll just move these other components off to the side. Okay, and then I'll expand this window. So you have this components toolbar at the moment. And we're going to drag this processor onto the screen. We want to generate random data. So I'm just going to call on a generate flow file. You can double click on this box here, and then it'll bring it in. Notice that there is a warning symbol. It's very difficult to see, actually. So there's this warning symbol, and it just tells me the file size is invalid. I need to specify what my file size is, and I also need to specify a relationship. We'll get to that in a moment. So I right click on the processor, the click, the cl so with the, the control key, and then I click on the mouse, click on configure. You have four different tabs that you can use to configure your processor. You can name the processor as well as define ter different relationships for the queues that these different processors are connected by. And then you can also schedule the processor. So you can, con you can tell, you can configure these processors to have a certain amount of threads that are running on them to be able to execute operations a lot faster. And then we're mainly going to be dealing with the properties section. So the properties, we want to tell this generate flow file file size, so we'll just specify one kilobyte. It's kind of difficult to see, but that, that's one kilobyte. And last but not least is the comment section. So that's just, if you want to specify what a particular processor is doing in the data flow, or you have a process group, it's a set of processors that com are comprised to create a new component that handles more complex computations, you can specify your comments there. Okay, so now we need to bring in another processor to land our data. So we're going to land our data within the local file system. So we'll use a put file processor. You see that there's tags. Actually, it's difficult. So there's tags you can specify. If you're looking for a particular keyword like archive, then all these different processors here that relate under the archive tags will appear if we didn't know the name of the processor. So we're going to use this put file processor. I double clicked it. I don't see it. There it is. So we have two processors now. Okay. It says directory is invalid, so we need to specify where we want to land the data, and then we need to specify the relationships. And it says upstream connections, so that just means we need to connect the two processors together. So, so you'll see as I move to this center of the processor, it has an arrow, and then it turns green once I move to the other processor. I just let go of it. It tells me create connection window, and that just includes the processors that are being connected as well as their relationship. So every time that the generate flow file processes data successfully, it's going to get routed on this queue that is having it connected to another processor. And you'll see here in settings, you can specify the queue name as well as some other properties, such as back pressure. Back pressure is just saying once all this data gets generated and it loads up to 10,000 bytes or bits, I want you, this other processor, to stop ingesting data, stop creating random data until that number minimizes. And then I told you guys about data prioritization earlier, so you can use first in, first out. You can also schedule the processor to work with the data that is the ones that have first arrived to that particular processor. Okay, so we have these two processors connected. Success relationship, there's still an issue. So we just need to specify the relationships and the directory path. The properties. Directory path, we'll just store it into our temp directory and NiFi and call it output. So 
output. And then we need to go into the settings tab. So we want to tell NiFi what to do with the data, in this case the flow files, once it's done processing it. So if it fails to process the data, in this case if it fails to land our data into our local file system, I want you to terminate that data. If it succeeds in it, I still want you to terminate the data because now we're at the end of the flow file, the, the data flow. Keep in mind though, the data itself that gets stored into your local file system isn't getting deleted. That is separate from a flow file. So we have these two processors. Now if I click, so I go into this operate toolbar and I can control whether or not my, my data flow is on, off, and I can also import different templates. So say I started building multiple uh, data flows already, and I want to send them onto, you know, I told you guys about these different nodes, and you can have them as one part of a cluster. You can make it very repetitive. Usually that happens in data on the edge. I'm going to start the data flow. <laughs> And I still need to start this one. So notice that put file processor started, but my generate processor didn't start. So now they're both started. And I do control, click, refresh. You can see the data is moving in real time. You can see it's hit 90, 9, it hit 9,000. So I'm gonna stop the data flow. Now we're gonna get into some data provenance, which I was telling you guys, you can actually track the data as it's moving throughout the data flow. So I right click on this processor. And then I click data provenance. What you'll see is a list of events, provenance events. A little info icon, the time that the process happened, what, was, what the processor did. You have a unique ID for every single flow file. So we'll click there and then we'll go into details. So it just gives you a run through of which particular processor was the one who committed the whole processing on the flow file and it'll tell you the attributes that it had extracted as well as the content. So since this is where everything was inputted, input is not accessible, but we can see the output of the generate flow file processor. So hopefully it works, unable to connect. So let's go to the second processor, the, the put file processor. Okay, right click, data provenance. attributes. It's not showing. So sometimes what happens with, with NiFi is that after the data has been processed and you don't actually go to the provenance, those provenance events you won't actually be able to see into the content. Usually that doesn't happen right away though, it, it tends to happen a lot later. But this is just like an overview of the whole uh, data provenance. There's also, I'm gonna zoom in here real quick, hopefully I can show you guys. So there's a data provenance visual icon that loads. And this is just telling you, so you have a flow file. So this is the flow file. It shows you what happened every single step through the whole data flow. So the flow file has been created, then it was sent, and it was dropped. In this case, it was sent to our local file system. As your data flows get more complex, you're gonna see more complex visualizations and transformations on the flow files. So okay, let's go back to the So we talked about data provenance, we talked about this data provenance in a visualization perspective. And there's a new sub-project that has evolved from the NiFi project called Apache Minify. So I've talked about running particularly NiFi no instances on your computers, but say that you didn't have, your hardware was limited in the amount of memory that you can use. Because you're working with sensors or you're working with Raspberry Pis. You could actually use an instance of Minify, which is this version of NiFi, smaller, it's a sub-project, and it can be located where the data is born, where it's generating, harnessed. So we'll go into a visual picture of that. 
So as you can see here, Minify is on the edge. So we have all these different variables that are generating data. Minify is ingesting the data, and it's sending it. This is us. The, the local machines that have, we are running local machines that have single noted NiFi instances running, and they may be doing some simple processing. Eventually, though, all that data is going to get routed to a data center, which is the area that NiFi specifically lives in. So Minify lives on the edge where all the data is being generated. NiFi lives in the data center. And usually that's where Hadoop and your other stream processing tools are. So how is NiFi able to do everything that it does? So here's just a little overview of the architecture. NiFi executes different operations within a Java virtual machine located in the uh, operating system host. And then we're able to access this NiFi user interface through a web server. And there's this flow controller that is the brains of the operation. It keeps track of everything that's happening within the data flow. So it keeps track of the data that gets exchanged as well as which particular processors are performing what operations on the data. So processor, again, is just an entity that performs actions on the data. Extensions are, for now, what you need to know is just they execute operations within the JVM. And you have these different repositories. So the flow file repository keeps track of known states of particular flow files as they're moving throughout the data flow. And then the content repository just stores all of the content bytes from these flow files into the local file system. And the provenance repository, we sort of you know, looked into that. It shows you provenance events, everything that has happened between the start of the flow file as it went through a processor, as well as what it was like, how it changed after it left the processor. Then I wanted to show you guys uh, a comparison between the NiFi architecture and the Minify. So you'll notice NiFi has a user interface, while Minify does not. But a lot of the framework, most of the framework, the different tools, management, toolbars, and everything is provided in Minify. And there's just less components. And for you guys who may be interested, Minify runs on a, two different agents, a Java agent. So there's more processors in this one. There is also a C++ agent, though. It's tech preview, so there's a lot that you can learn from. I was talking about contributing to open source earlier. and the interesting thing with this C++ agent, for you guys who are taking C++, they're still listing out the features in the documentation that are going to be built. So if you wanted to go look into that particular issue, contribute your particular code to that, you could actually become an Apache Minify committer. Oh, and an advantage for Minify uh, when you're using C++ is if you have hardware that has limited amount of memory, you can put the C++ version of Minify on top of it. And I just talked about NiFi clusters a little bit. So all I said earlier was just you have these single noted NiFi instances running, like you guys and your laptops, and they come together to create a NiFi cluster. Uh, the extra is this Zookeeper client, which what it does is it elects two different nodes within the cluster to be a primary node and a cluster coordinator. So the primary node actually guarantees that if Christian and New are working on the same part of a data flow, right? On the same team, only Christian can make a change to that particular processor. New has to wait before she can make the configuration update as well. And the cluster coordinator, what that does is it just monitors the life, the status of all these different nodes within the cluster. So here's just a comparison side by side view of a single noted instance and a cluster of NiFi. So let's, let's just bring it back. Why is NiFi so important? NiFi, instead of having to look through numerous lines of code to add into a new feature for your data flow, you can literally just take a processor from that components toolbar I showed you earlier, drop it into your data flow, and have that turnaround time within minutes instead of, say, hours or days. Security, so throughout the entire data flow, every single part of it is guaranteed that your data will be encrypted. And NiFi can handle wide varieties of different data formats. So if you have multiple people who want to stay within working with JSON or Avro, CSV, 
then those teams won't get upset. And the visual canvas. The visual canvas just makes it very easy to make updates to the data flow and even debug. So something I didn't talk about earlier was just when you come into an error, usually you have to look through numerous lines of logs within a log file, or it could be multiple log files. But with NiFi, as we saw earlier, NiFi will pinpoint you to where the error is on a particular processor, and you can actually make the change at that processor instead of having to look through those numerous lines. So we'll get into the traffic patterns demo. So this is just the lab portion, the use case that you guys will be working on, the step-by-step -step tutorial. You are on an urban city planning board and they're evaluating uh, a new highway that they want to build in San Francisco area. And instead of looking at historical data, they want to see the data coming in at real time. So you're going to use Apache NiFi to be this real time ingestion tool. And you're going to figure out with not this tool the particular route that would be best to bring in this highway. So let's jump into the demo. I'll just give you a rough overview of uh, one of the data flows that you'll be building in the lab today. Okay. So the interesting thing about NiFi is once you build a data flow, you can actually have templates that you import into the NiFi instance. So I'll drag that template onto the screen. Let's go to lab one. We'll add that. You can't see it because I zoomed in so much. Oops. So the, uh, the color contrast for the blue isn't really complementing this, this projector screen, but it's okay. I'm just gonna walk you through what each section of the, the data flow does. So we have this git file processor. It's ingesting data from our local file system. And then you have the unpacked content processor that's used for usually when you have like a zip file or some kind of compressed file that contains multiple files, you'll unpack them. And you don't want all the data just being pushed into the rest of the data flow because it'll, it's like combinational logic and digital design. I won't get into that though, but uh, it'll be pushed instantly to the rest of the data flow. So we need to control the rate at which that data is moving. And that's what we use the control rate processor for. And then once the data moves to the second phase of the data flow, we are going to extract particular key attributes from the XML files. That's the data format that every processor, I mean, that every flow file has. Once we extract that data, this last section is actually going to route the data. So it's going to filter the data for particular key attributes we're looking for. And in this case, it's filtering for, it's filtering for just verifying that every attribute in the flow file has data. So we want to make sure that the speed is not zero. That's what that particular route attribute processor would do. Eventually, though, what's happening is we don't want the data to be in XML when it lands into our local file system. We want it to be in a different structure. So we're going to use a couple different processors here to go and convert the XML to JSON. And that's actually what you'll be learning for lab one today in the demo, I mean not in the demo, in the lab part of the meetup today. Okay, we'll go back to the slides. So I'll point you to some just getting started resources where you can further learn about NiFi and the big data tools out there. So you have the Apache NiFi site, the documentation, very good, has a lot of information. And Minify site, like I told you guys, all these features are being thought of, but they actually haven't been out and built, built yet. 
that you could contribute to that in C++ or Java. And then here are just tutorials, different links you can go to to further learn about big data and how to use these different tools for your particular use cases or just the technology in general. We have this Hornworks community connection. So you've heard of Stack Overflow. How many of you have heard of Stack Overflow? How many of you have heard of Hornworks community connection though? Okay, a few people, a few people. Well, it's like Stack Overflow except for it targets big data. So we have our engineers on site monitoring this particular website, this forum. And any time that you're working on a use case with, say, HBase or Scala from Spark, they will answer your questions within minutes, sometimes hours. But it's usually very fast. And it's a very helpful forum. And it's free. You don't have to pay for it to use it. And just more learning resources. There's a Hadoop Summit where you can watch videos and look through slides, past summits. I actually would highly advise for you to look into next year's San Jose Hadoop Summit. Because this past summit, we were actually able to get a lot of students in for free. Normally, the rates to get into these are like thousands of dollars. So a lot of different people from all over the world come to these, and it's a great way to network and you learn. Questions? Section, yeah, questions, anyone? There are processors, oh, so the question that he had asked is, so if you have data that's coming from other data sources and it's coming from like a MySQL database, how would you go and ingest that data with NiFi? Well, NiFi makes it very easy for you, so your data is at rest in those data stores and all you need to do is just use a MySQL-like processor that's used for ingesting the data and NiFi will take care of it for you. So you won't have to worry about writing on the other end a particular script to ingest the data. NiFi takes care of it. You just have to specify the configuration parameters. That's pretty much it. That I showed you guys earlier when I was going through the put file and the, get, the generate flow file processors. Any other questions? Uh, what's your team <laughs> Yeah. Workshop session, so you can get NiFi up and running on your local machines or on a Hortonworks sandbox. I'll turn this off now that we are going to transfer. Everyone who tuned into the live stream as well, we really appreciate you guys coming out and listening to our presentation today. Thank you.